Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation Home Sale Negotiating Strategies Get ready to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia 5 Negotiating Strategies When Selling Your Home, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This is by Amy Fontaine, updated April 11th, 2022. Five Negotiating Strategies when selling your home. So we're on the sale of the home side of things. Selling your home is likely one of the biggest financial transactions you'll undertake in your lifetime. So clearly with the home, the purchase of the home and the selling of the home, some of the biggest financial transactions individuals deal with given the dollar amounts involved with them in relation to other types of financial transactions for an individual. And the price you agree on with a buyer along with the real estate commissions you pay will determine how much money you walk away with. So clearly we wanna spend a little bit more time uh, with these larger type of transactions that have a more long-term impact into the future going through a more formal process. These negotiating strategies could put you in the driver's seat and help you get a top dollar in any market. So clearly negotiation is gonna be part of the game whenever you're trying to sell the home because it's a market. We're putting it out on the market here. So number one, counter at your list price. As a seller, you probably won't want to accept a potential buyer's initial bid on your home if it's below your asking price. So typically you could try to put a firm price out there when you're gonna when you're gonna price something and say, hey, look, I'm not a negotiator person here. I'm gonna say this is my price. I'm putting it out there and I'm gonna I'm, that's what I expect for the offer. That's one way you could try to do it. Or oftentimes you're going to put it out there at one price and you expect to be haggled with uh, in the market. Of course, how much haggling will take place will depend on the, the type of market. Is it a seller's market? Is it a buyer's market? If you're expecting for someone to come back and haggle, which is often the case in a, in a, in a market type of situation, then you might set the price higher than the price that you actually uh, would be okay with settling at so that you can expect other offers to come in below that price and then get into the get into the negotiation process here uh, and so buyers usually expect a back and forth negotiation so their initial off offer will often be lower than your list price so again you don't really have to s accept that that uh, term or that metric or that way of doing things if it's like a seller's market and you're basically saying hey look i'm i'm in the driver's seat here in that case right i have the uh, I have the advantage in the market conditions. I'm going to set the price and I'm, and that's what I expect to sell it for. You might be able to get it in that point. Obviously, if it's not a seller's market, if it's a buyer's market, the buyers are, are more likely to have, they have more leverage and you're likely to get a lot more uh, haggling type of things, which is a kind of traditional way of dealing with any kind of market condition. But it may also be the lower than what they're actually willing uh, to pay. So clearly, you know, from the, from the seller side of things, if we were going into something that we know is going to be a haggling situation, we would set the price high. We want to put the bar high and then and then expect some it's going to be pulled down. And then on the on the buyer side of things, they would try to lowball it for the initial offer and then expect that the that it would be going up from there. And of course, you meet somewhere in the middle. So you want that initial anchoring price to be to be higher to set the mindset to set the to set things up generally if you're going into that kind of negotiation but however the the downside of that of course is that then you're listing the price at a, at a higher price and you're going through the whole uh, haggling kind of process versus listing it at the price you actually want to sell it for and just saying that's what i'm going to sell it for so at this point most sellers will make a counter offer with a price that's higher but still below the list price because they're afraid of losing the potential sale so they want to seem flexible and willing to negotiate to close the deal this strategy does indeed work in terms of getting the property sold as thousands of dollars can attest uh, but it's not necessarily the best way to get top dollar Instead of dropping your price, counter by sticking to your listed purchase price. Someone who really wants to buy will remain engaged and come back to you with a higher offer. So you might say, okay, if I'm gonna start at my list price, someone comes back and they give me a price below that, which is what I expect, but I still want to, I'd want to sell to them. So instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna bring my price down and we'll, we'll meet somewhere in the middle, maybe you just say, I'm gonna stick to my listed price 
and see if they f- see if they do something from there, right? You're playing more of a hardball kind of strategy. I'm going to stick to the listed price and see if they give you another counter offer up or in, upping their bid again. So assuming that you've priced your property fairly to begin with, count, uh, countering at your list price says that you know what your property is worth and you intend to get the money you deserve. So again, you could have a strategy of saying, I'm going to put my money on, I'm going to put my property on the market at what I basically expect to receive and then I'm gonna be way less flexible with this kind of negotiating stuff. I'm not playing games here. I didn't set the price at absorbently high so that I can so that I can haggle with someone. I set it at what I expect to sell it for. And then you could try to and then you could try to be more firm in that case. That would be one method that you can use. So buyers may be surprised and some will turn turned off by the unwillingness to negotiate. So clearly some buyers like the haggling process. That's kind of what you know what they expect. So if you don't come down on the price, they're going to say, well, you're, you know, you're not playing the game, right? Or something like that. But again, you're setting the rules to the game as the seller. And if you're, if it's a seller's market, you have the capacity to set the rules at the game and say, well, no, that's not how I'm doing it here. I'm putting it on there basically at what I want to sell it for. And I think there's buyers out there willing to pay that for it. So you do risk having a buyer walk away when you use this strategy. However, you'll also avoid wasting time on buyers who make uh, lowball offers and won't close any deal unless they can get a bargain. So oftentimes you deal with people, the people that really like to negotiate and haggle might not always be the best person we want to sell to anyways, because as we go through the negotiation, they might be nitpicking, you know, they're more likely you would think to try to go after any, any kind of, any kind of concession throughout the whole process, right? As opposed to as opposed to being able to say, look, I set the price, I think it's fair right there. It's a seller's market. I, I, I want to pick someone up that's that agrees with that and basically is willing to make the deal at that point and not, you know, possibly haggle every every step through the process. But it just depends on again if it's a seller's market, buyer's market and this and the conditions of it as well as your kind of strategy or feeling towards the negotiation strategy. A variation on con- on countering at your list price is to counter just slightly below it, uh, conceding by perhaps a thousand dollars. So you're going to say, okay, I'm going to just drop it by a thousand dollars just to keep this other person hooked, and then we and then we play the game, right? Then we keep on going. Use this approach when you want to be tough but are afraid that appearing too inflexible will drive away buyers. Number two, reject the offer. If you're gutsy enough, you can try a negotiation tactic that's more extreme than countering at your list price. So in other words, we had the list price before and we said, well, we could just simply counter at that list price or lower it by a very low amount like $1,000 or you could just say that I'm going to reject the offer outright Uh, if it's below the list price. And again, if it's in a seller's market, you might be able to do that. You might be able to put the impression out there and say, I'm setting the terms here. The the selling price is what I believe is fair. And I'm just going to look for an offer for the selling price. In other words, I'm not going to play the whole negotiation strategy. And if you're able to do that, maybe you'll you'll get the offer then. And maybe you'll be working with someone that's less likely to try to try to uh, get an edge on every kind of piece of, of the negotiation if they think you know the offer is fair. So reject the buyer's offer, but don't counter at all. To keep them in the game, you then ask them to submit a new offer. So you could say, basically, I'm gonna reject the offer. You can send another offer and possibly simply say, hey, look, <laughs> I set the price at what I think is, I think is a fair price to sell it at. And I'm trying not to, to do the, I'm not doing the negotiation thing. I think I will be able to sell it at that price. It is what it is. So if they're really interested and you haven't turned them off, they will. This strategy sends a strong signal that you know your property is worth what you're asking for it. So if that is the case, again, if you're in a seller's market and you're saying, I know what the property's worth, I, I think I can get this price for it. I think there's buyers out there that will give me that price then I'm just not going to be flexible. I'm not going to do the whole bargaining thing. You might be able to do that in certain situations. If the buyer resubmits, they'll have to make a higher offer unless they decide to play hardball uh, uh, back and submit the same or even a lower offer. So obviously they can send whatever other offer they want to do uh, at that point, and then you can go back and forth with it. 
from there. When you don't counter, you're not ethically locked into a negotiation with a particular buyer and you can accept a higher offer if it comes alone. Uh, for the buyer, knowing that someone may make a better offer at any moment creates pressure to submit a more competitive offer quickly if they really want the property. So clearly, if you just re reject it outright and say, oh, I would accept another offer, this is basically the price I'm asking for. I think I have other people out there that would be willing to go at this price if they really want the property, then clearly, and they're willing to pay the price that, that is fair. If, they, if you think that was a fair price, then they might give another offer. This strategy can be particularly useful if the property has only been on the market for a short time or if you have an open house coming up. Number three, try to create a bidding war. Speaking of open house, make them an integral part of your process. So after listing the property on the market and making it available to be shown, schedule an open house for a few days later. Refuse to entertain any offers until after the open house. So we're going to have the open house. Hopefully that'll put, you know, put some competition, uh, put, some, put some vibes out there in the market that people, this is a house, this is a house people want out there. Potential buyers will expect to be in competition and may place higher offers as a result. If you get multiple offers, you can go back to the top bidders and ask for their highest and best offers. Of course, the open house may yield only one offer, but the party offering it won't know that. Uh, so you'll have a psycho psychological edge going forward with counter offers. So clearly when people make offers to you, then they don't know who else is making, who else is in the market. So you have a bit of an edge in terms of the information gap on your side than, than what they have. So you might have only one person you're dealing with. That's the only offer I got. But as far as they know, I just had an open house. They saw some people walking through there. They might think there's a whole bunch of people in line for this piece of property. Number four, put exp exp expiration date on your counter offer. So this is a classic selling strategy that offer is limited. The time is limited. Act now. So we got, we got to have a sense of urgency involved there. Say a buyer submits an offer that you don't want to accept and you counter their offer. So now classic kind of uh, negotiation or contract kind of law uh, here. He, they give us an offer. We don't accept the offer. We give the counter offer, which basically negates the original offer. And then you have a new offer on the table, which the other person can accept or deny, give a counter offer. You're then involved in a negotiation with that party. And generally it is considered unethical to accept a better offer from another buyer. If one comes along, if one comes along, though, it is not illegal. Uh, it is possible as a no as noted above to be involved in multiple negotiations with several buyers at the same time it is the seller's prerogative to disclose or not disclose this information to the prospective buyers so the seller clearly has you know some advantage in terms of who they're who they're dealing with and it's up to them to be it's as to whether how open they want to be uh, with that information and if, obviously there's pros and cons to to being open or not open uh, with that kind of information. So disclosure can result in higher offers, but it can also frighten, frighten off a buyer. The seller is legally allowed to counter more than one offer at the same time, that, but they must include appropriate language, letting all the parties know of the situation. In the interest of selling your home quickly, consider putting an expiration date on your counter offers. So if, again, that time frame. This strategy compels the buyer to make a decision so you can either get your home under contract or move on. Don't make the deadline so short that the buyer is turned off, but consider making it shorter than the default time frame in your state's standard real estate contract. So you're gonna tighten it up a little bit, uh, but not, not make it like ridiculous, right? Act now, you gotta click on the button, <laughs> right? Within the next five minutes or the thing is over. So if the default expiration is three days, you might shorten it uh, to one or two days. In addition to closing the deal quickly, there's another reason to push sellers to make a fast decision. While their counter offer is outstanding, your home is effectively off the market. Many buyers won't submit an offer when another negotiation is underway. So clearly you wanna be able to kind of mitigate the time frames if it's not a good match. So, and if the deal falls through, You've added time to the off to the official uh, number of days your home has been on the market. 
The more days your home is on the market, the less desirable it appears and the more likely you are to have a lower you have to lower your asking price to get a buyer. Number five, agree to pay closing costs. It seems like it's become standard practice for the buyers uh, to ask the seller to pay their closing costs. These costs can amount to about 3% of the purchase price and cover what seem to be a lot of frivolous fees. Buyers are often feeling cash strapped from the down payment, moving expenses, the prospect of redecorating costs, and maybe even from paying the closing costs on the home they sold. Some buyers can't afford to close the deal at all without assisting closing costs. So again, it kind of depends if it's a seller's market or a buyer's market. Uh, if if uh, people are strapped for cash, then you might be able to close the deal by lightening up the cash flow burden uh, with those upfront closing costs. So while many buyers don't, ha don't have or uh, don't want to spend extra cash upfront to get into the home, they can often afford to borrow a little bit more. If you give them the cash they, they want for closing costs, the transaction may be more likely to proceed. When a buyer submits an offer and asks you to pay the closing costs, counter with your willingness to pay, but at an increased purchase price, even if it means going above your list price. So in other words, if you're going to say, okay, they're strapped for cash, they can't pay the closing costs, that's because it's an upfront cost and it's not rolled into the loan. So you could say, you could say, okay, well, I have the cash flow. Maybe I can give you the cash for the closing costs, but I'm going to up the, the price of the home, which means there's the buyer still kind of responsible for the closing costs in essence but it's going to be rolled into possibly the loan in that situation which should help with the with the cash flow uh, problem that they're that they're facing that's one one negotiating strategy so buyers sometimes uh, don't realize that when they ask the seller to pay their closing costs they're effectively lowering the home's sales price obviously that's a form of lowering the home sales price if in that in that case so as the seller of course you'll see the bottom line very clearly. Uh, you can increase your asking price by enough to still get a, as high as your list price after paying the buyer's closing costs. If your list price is 200,000 and the buyer offers 190,000 with 6,000 uh, toward closing, you would counter with something between 196,000 and 206,000, right? So then you'd say, okay, you want me to pay your $6,000 closing costs and you and you want the sales price to be 190,000 instead of my asking price of 200,000 but I'm paying your closing costs so I'm going to up it to at least your offer plus the 6,000 196,000 or my offer 200,000 plus the 6,000 and that way so why would the why would the buyer be okay with that because they'd still be able to get the closing costs basically rolled into the loan <laughs> instead of having to pay them up front because they don't have the cash flow to pay them up front. So, the, so uh, a catch is that the price plus closing costs must be supported when the home is appraised. So then when you go through the appraisal process, the, the appraisal could appraise for something less than what, you, than what you have the listing price for. And if that happens, that can be, that can be a problem to get the deal done. So that's something that, to keep in mind when you're raising the price from the closing costs that could put a wrench in the works, as they say. So otherwise, you'll have to lower it uh, later to close the deals because the buyer's lender won't approve an overpriced sale. So the bottom line, the key to ex executing these negotiating strategies successfully is that you have to be offering a superior product. So clearly, you'd, you'd like to be able to say, I'm confident with the home I'm selling, I'm confident in the value of it, and therefore, uh, then you can be you could go into the negotiations feeling secure about it. So the home needs to show well, be in excellent condition, and have something that competing properties do not. If you want to have upper hand in negotiations, so uh, so if you have a you know if your property is valuable, then you can move forward with it. And plus, if it's a if it's a seller's market, if the market is just leaning towards the seller side of things then you can be you can you have a bit more leverage to be a more stringent in your negotiation process uh, if buyers aren't excited about the property you're offering your hardball tactics won't cause cause them to up their game they'll just walk away